Hi, I'm Caitlin. Hi, I'm Rebecca. We're not from Memphis, but we love it. Welcome to Memphis Type History, the podcast. All right. Hello, I'm Rebecca Phillips, and we're going to learn about a particular pastime adventure from Memphis. Richard Halliburton was one of the most famous adventure writers of the late 20s and through the 30s, with books on the bestseller list for years. He was also well known as a lecturer and radio personality. Whether it was climbing Mount Olympus in Greece, swimming the length of the Panama Canal, or sleeping on the top of the Great Pyramid in Egypt, Halliburton had a way of completely captivating his audience with his elaborative storytelling of each adventure. Best to document those stories is R. Scott Williams, who includes letters, articles, and a glimpse into the crazy life of Halliburton from Memphis, Tennessee, in his book, The Forgotten Adventures of Richard Halliburton. With me today is Scott Williams, Chief Operating Officer of the Museum in Washington, D.C., and author. Thanks for joining us on the show. Thank you so much for having me here. I feel like I'm talking to a celebrity because (laughs) I have so much fun in Washington. Like when I'm driving to work, when I'm on my bike, I listen to your um, podcast and it's so exciting to hear things back here because I love Memphis history. And so, you know, you don't get a ton of Memphis history while you're in Washington, D.C. So you are filling a huge service for those of us that are living in other cities. Well, I appreciate that. And I myself am am a little intimidated because not only are you from Memphis, but you're an author and chief operating officer of the museum, which is an amazing museum out in Washington, D.C. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. So let me know if I get anything wrong because I feel like you're more the historian than I am here. No, no. Please. (laughs) I'm humbled to be here. Absolutely not. Awesome. Well... I have a list of questions for you. I'm ready. All right. So first of all, how do you know of Richard Halliburton and what inspired you to write a book about him? So my family is originally from Haywood County, Tennessee, which is, you know, about a, about an hour from here between Memphis and Jackson. And so Brownsville, Tennessee. So I have a blog, um, haywoodcountyline.com, where I trace my ancestry and I write about people that are from that area. And Richard Halliburton's mother and father met there and had him there. And so, you know, I stumbled across him, so I wrote a little little tiny blog entry about him, and a publisher, the History Press, emailed and said, we like that, would you be interested in writing a book about him? I guess at the time they were trying to find local you know, writers yeah. to write about topics, and so I hadn't really thought about it, but I said, well, you know, why not? So I jumped in, and the more I researched, the more I found out he's really a fascinating person who had really, to some degree, been forgotten. Of course, being from Memphis, I knew about the Halliburton Tower at Rhodes um, and my kids um, went to Snowden so we did a lot of things with Rhodes and so you know I was familiar with that but I didn't realize just how successful he had been in his day and what a Mm -hmm. uh, what a strange and fascinating life he actually led yeah yeah I noticed that in the book that the Rhodes um, that his father was it a little memorial what does it look like well it's it's um, if you're driving down Parkway it's Mm -hmm. that big giant tower that you see that's part of Rhodes College that oh. faces, that's called Halliburton Tower. Okay. And, and so his father gave the money to build the that's tower, nice. and they all he also gave all of uh, Richard Halliburton's, um, the, the collection of articles and scrapbooks, he gave that to the university as well. And they've done a, a really good job of archiving everything and keeping up with it. And they were really helpful on, on writing the book and sharing a, a lot of really information, or a lot of good information with me. Bill, who's the archivist over there, is really fantastic. Yeah, what was his, did um, the Halliburtons have a connection to Rhodes, or why Rhodes in particular? Yeah, you know what, the Halliburtons did have a bit of connection to um, to the to the college in that when it was in its former location, Richard's father had been a part of that, and he was on the board, and so they were very involved in the university, and they were both, both his mother and father were very intelligent and very into education, and um, his mother was one of the first psychologists in Memphis, um, and so they were just okay. very very smart, intelligent people, and they loved education, and 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 they had they had instilled in Richard Halliburton, their son, a spirit of adventure and appreciation for writing and reading. And he he had originally intended to leave everything, all of his collection, to Princeton. Um, so I think it was great that his father, because that was his alma mater. So I think it's great that his father chose instead to give it to to Rhodes. Okay, very nice. So. Richard Halliburton had a great drive and motivation to travel and write about his adventures for publication. In your book, we get the sense that this was a time that reading literature of individuals' adventures were sought after. This popular genre reminds me of travel explorers on popular TV shows today, like 
maybe Anthony Bourdain or mm-hmm. the Bear Girls guy. Right. Um, maybe even like before me was probably Steve Irwin. Mm-hmm. Um, what was the name of that one? Yeah. Um, yep. Crocodile I, Hunter. Right. Yep, that's right. So, because I I spent a lot of time just thinking of what is in, in comparison to what he was doing, and it was mm-hmm. so popular back then. What can we compare it to to now? So that's what I thought of. Where maybe the travel shows and those people. So for you, if Richard Halliburton were to host a TV show today, what do you think that would be like? And could you come up with the title? Sure, yeah. I mean, and that's really interesting because what, what Richard did was he took a brand new medium and there were there were really multiple new mediums during the um, 20s when he was writing. And it, one was public speaking in, in the late teens and, and in the 20s. Public speaking was what people did instead of being able to go to the movies or you know watch yeah. TV. They went to hear people just make big presentations about adventure, and, and you know he was fantastic at that. So he had a lot of charisma, and he was able to really present well. We don't know exactly what he sounded like now because there are no recordings of him. Aww. But apparently, he was just you know captivating to hear him present. Mm-hmm. His uh, business model, if you will, is that he would. Uh, do a big adventure, then write, speak, and, and travel around and talk about it to generate enough money to do the next adventure. And so he just kept the snowball getting bigger and bigger. Yeah. So, you know, he would definitely be one of those people today who would have a travel brand around himself. So his personal brand would be travel. He would have a television show, but he would also have probably a podcast. Um, he would definitely have, you know, a blog, and then he would probably have a line of products for sale at, you know, travel adventure stores. He would have a bike line. He would have, you know, he would have yeah. all different types of outdoorsy, adventurous type products. What he would call his show, he, if you read his books, he writes a lot about um, romance, and he uses the word the <laughs> yeah. royal road to romance. Yeah, he was stuck on that title. Yeah, he used People try that. to shut that one down, didn't they? Yeah, he used a lot of he was very because a lot of people couldn't travel and travel was just now starting to open up Mm. so I think he saw travel as being an adventurous spirit and and an attitude of romance and so I think romance would definitely be in the (laughs) the title of his TV show yeah (laughs) so anyway but yeah something like that but he would definitely be taking advantage of all the technology that we have now yeah he seemed pretty uh, ambitious oh for sure absolutely and motivated Another interesting char- uh, character throughout in the book that I noticed was Mary Hutchison. Uh, she's a recurring character throughout your book. She started what we know today as Hutchison School, and we learned that she started the school in Richard Halliburton's home when he was a toddler, around 1902-ish. Uh, she essentially was a part of the family. What did you find most intriguing about her? Yeah, I mean, so you know, here was a lady who never married. And she um, had lost her, uh, like you know, parents early, early on. So she really didn't have much of a family. The Halliburtons didn't have a lot of extended family that they were close to. So to me, it was interesting how these people who were very, very uh, alone kind of bonded together and created their own little family. And so uh, Mrs. Halliburton, Richard's mother, and Mary Hutchison met in Brownsville, um, when, or they actually met in, in um, Athens where they were teaching. And then mm-hmm. they, they taught together in Brownsville and then came to Memphis. And the Halliburtons came to Memphis first, you know, to be able to make more money in real estate, you know, for Mr. Halliburton. But then they saw a need for a teacher, so they sent for her. And the two of them, the couple had a name for her. They called her Hutchie. So that was sort of their nickname. So Hutchie came. She lived with them for a while and taught school. And then they were closer than relatives throughout the rest of their lives. Um, and she's even buried with them as well. So, oh, wow. Um, yeah. In the same family plot. Richard thought of her as his grandmother. And he called her Ann Mutter because he couldn't say grandmother when he was uh. little. So he called her Ann Mutter through his, through his entire life. Mm-hmm. So, you know, she was just such a... You know, hardcore part of the family. I thought that was interesting. Did she end up teaching him in a school in schooling at all? Yeah, or I mean, I think she taught him one on one. I don't, I don't know if I, no, because she um, mostly taught girls. So okay, it he, was always with yeah, the girls. Yeah, okay. so but but at home, I'm sure you know okay. she taught and read, and and she too was responsible for you know giving him a spirit of adventure and and appreciating education. That was a big thing for all of them. Yeah, it sounded like it. But it's re- it was really fascinating to me to have grown up here and you know I know lots of uh, girls who went to Hutchison but it never dawned on me you know why is it called Hutchison I never thought to go into where it started from right and so the 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 people at Hutchison were really really friendly and nice and let me go through their archives and got some research done there as well so now I never hear Hutchison that I don't think about her now 
You know, yeah. so for 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 me, Hutchison is Mary Hutchison. You know, who who Hutchie? Yeah, I Hutchie. should call her Hutchie. Hutchie. Yeah. yeah, I'm I'm a member of the family now. <laughs> yeah. Are you gonna get buried with them? <laughs> I, I don't know. I that, they probably wouldn't let me. Oh, okay. I have my own family cemetery. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> All right. Among Mary Hutchison, you mention other important females in the Forgotten Adventures of Richard Halliburton, particularly during the time when aviation was becoming popular. You wrote. Many women saw flying as a way to express their equality to men at a time when they had only recently begun voting. Pilots of both sexes became equal to the most well-known and popular celebrities of the day, and their feats were covered in newspapers and magazines, on the radio and in newsreels shown in movie theaters around the world. How do you think that was possible when it comes to flying but wasn't as accessible in other disciplines? I mean, I, you know, I've thought about that. I, I think part of it was men were afraid, you know, to yeah. get up in a plane. And, and so, women were just so like the so... Women, so, you know, I mean, some men did it, and so I think some, you know, a lot of women were afraid, but if a woman... Wanted to, I think she could. you know people would be like, okay, yeah. <laughs> you know, and, and the fact that women knew like they'll let me do it, right? Okay. And there were extra planes, you know, left over from World War II, and they had a lot, you know, they had advanced. You know, the whole business of flying airplanes. And they actually took airplanes from city to city, and there were flying shows. And the, the people who became pilots were, like, you know, superstars. And I think if a woman wanted to, and there was this whole pilot subculture that I just loved researching. Um, I, I, a lot of it didn't make it in the book because there had to be a certain number of pages. But, yeah. you know, the whole subculture in that era of, you know, there was a, a pilot named Poncho Barnes who, you know, I wrote a little bit about that Richard um, was friends with. And just all these pilots that bonded together and created this just, you know, almost like a rodeo kind of subculture yeah. that was really exciting. And there's been a lot written about it, but that, that was really intriguing to me that Richard sort of brushed up against that. I mean, he was honestly never more than a than a passenger, you know, right. so any of us probably could have, you know. But he did have his little groupie, his two pilot friends. Right, right. He was yeah, with. What, absolutely. What's the woman's name? Um, um, and you know what? You're going to ask me in a minute, I suspect, about my favorite adventure of Richard's. And it's that one. It it's, was her. It was when Richard needed, you know, he always looked for sort of a hook. I mean, he was mm-hmm. a brilliant marketer. And so he was always looking for a hook. And so he thought, what if I fly to my next adventure? And so he uh, set up a meeting in the Roosevelt Hotel. It was brand new, you know, which is now it's, you know, an old hotel. But yeah. with, with Moy Stevens who was an actor and a stunt pilot and who was just the opposite of Richard Halliburton. And so, <laughs> you know, he offered uh, Moy, he said, um, I tell you what, for, and I can't remember, it was two, almost two years, 18 months. For 18 months, almost two years, we'll go wherever you want to go. We'll do whatever adventure, you know, we, you won't have to worry about any money, any food. You know, you just, all you have to do is fly the plane. And so he said, okay, I'm in. So they literally flew all over the world. They flew through jungles. They flew inside volcanoes. They yeah. flew, you know, they flew all over the world. And th- to me, this would make a great movie. So we should go in together yeah. and make a movie about yeah, this part of his. Yeah, let's do that. <laughs> so there was a, a pilot named Ellie Beinhorn, you know, who was apparently, you know, very uh, adventurous, but very beautiful. And mm-hmm. so they, they had heard about her, but they'd never met her. So they met her and they both fell in love with her. And so yeah. the three of them flew all around. And what I think is so fascinating is um, Richard and Ellie both flew around with a Victrola and their own set of records that went with it. So wherever they go, they could mm-hmm. put it on. And they traded their complete collections intact with each other. So yeah. it's like the first mixtape. You yeah. Know? It's like, you know, so she eventually... Um, Moy was much more of a candidate for a husband for her, and so yeah. um, he proposed even. But she was Richard Halburn did. No, Moy Stevens oh, proposed. Okay. Yeah, Richard I, just loved her in a different kind of well, way. I must have read that wrong because I thought she must have been really. <laughs> yeah. a I think Richard he loved because he did say he loved he her. He did. Yeah, he said he That's loved why her. I got confused. But I think Moy really loved her, yeah, and so obviously. Moy proposed, Moy um, and she 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 said no. Uh, because she wasn't ready to settle down. She wanted to keep right. flying. Yeah. And so she... Um, but the truth is, her heart went to Halliburton, who... <laughs> because when there's three, there's got to be a love triangle. In a that's baby, right. Least, that's right? right. Well, and to me, the, the greatest <laughs> scene is... And in in, uh, she had written about it, and Richard had written about it. Uh-huh. They were in Berkshire, which is on the Persian um, Gulf. It's sort of a very deserty area. 
and they had parked there for the night and they're playing and they had their Victrola out and they were playing records the three of them listen you know yeah. and I just think that you know, and that's the royal road to romance right that there that right there yeah. yeah and that's romantic I I did I love reading about that and just because you can imagine yourself getting you, your two close friends together and doing when you're going to do adventures like that of course you're going to grow completely close to these people and bond with them. That's right. And music was a, such a part and of that. And with the music. And, that they ha- and yes. what it must have sounded like to be out like in the desert. Where, oh, yeah. You know, I'm sure they had a fire. And so, you yeah. know, anyway, I can see that scene. If anybody needs to buy a book, it's just for that whole chapter right there. Thank you. Yeah. I appreciate that. Or if anybody yeah. wants to make a movie. I, and that would be right. that would be a good movie, and not the movie that Richard Halliburton was in, right? Right. Which was the it was India. Yeah. Um, it, does it, it supposedly exists somewhere? Like like you didn't the, find it. The, I never found it. Okay. But, but uh, you a, found the movie poster for it. I though. found the poster. India speaks. India speaks. Yeah. yeah. Um, hopefully someday someone will find the actual movie. Wouldn't that be exciting? Yeah, I'll put. I'll make sure to put that image on the show notes. Hmm, yeah. So if anybody sees it and can. Track it down for us, please do. Yeah. India speaks. All right. So now I got to ask of all your Halliburton adventures, and yes. maybe you just said it. Which is your favorite? That was the favorite. That was the favorite. Yeah, that was. Yeah. My, I mean, he did okay. a lot. I mean, he did. I mean, he really did a lot. Yeah. Because each time, you know, he had to generate something else to mm-hmm. to top what he had done before. So yeah. he just kept doing more and more. But to me, that was more personal, and it, it, you know, it, it was just. It was more than just an adventure. He really, yeah. um, you know, he and, and he really liked Moy Stevens, and he actually dedicated the book that came out of that trip to Moy Stevens. And oh, so nice. that little adventure has it all. It has love. It has it has yeah. bromance. Has a, an early bromance going yeah, on there. So it did. Um, so anyway, yeah, I think that's by far my favorite. Yeah. Well, I, I can get that from reading it. Then now that you say that. My, I think mine might have been the um, the elephant. Even though I felt bad for the elephant, right? The extreme he went. He felt he was so determined. Right. Well, and there's actually footage of the elephant of him on the elephant. There's footage but it's of silent him. footage. Okay. You can't you can't hear him speak. Yeah. But there's footage of him riding the elephant, and you know it, it was a little bit um, over dramatic um, yeah. the way he set it up and everything. But you know, it, yeah, it's a, it's a good one. I think that was a good indication of his personality. Was that whole adventure? I got the sense from what you wrote that Halliburton was a little bit elaborative mm-hmm. in his stories, mm-hmm. maybe even a little bit exaggerated. And mm-hmm. I think he, he even pointed that out himself. Like, he mm-hmm. wouldn't deny it. Right. He said he threw a coat of red paint on things. Yes. What you have to do if you're going to be right. a lecturer and a, and a writer. Right. Sure. You have to captivate the audience. So how much do you think he probably did of that exaggerating or elaborating well, I mean, one one uh, baseline that we have to work with is his trip with Moy Stevens, and Moy Stevens lived a long to be a long, you know, a, a to a ripe old age. I can't remember seventy or whatever. So he lived a long time. So he was able to sort of confirm or deny what Richard had written about, and for the most part, it was true. There were a couple of little things he pointed out and said, you know. But what's interesting is the things that Richard lied about were kind of obvious. They were kind of the things. So that, he did lie then. That, Oh yeah, no. He so definitely, I was curious, like the Taj Mahal pool. Now I think he did, he did do, do that. Okay. Yeah, that he did. It's do. just unfortunate he didn't have a spectator with him. Right, right. And there's a small, there are smaller pool. There are different size pools, and you know, so oh, okay. yeah. So he he could have. Now, did he stay all night? You know, and who knows? Or did he just jump in real fast? And yeah. you know, yeah. but. Um, the vast majority of what he wrote about, he had to have either done it or something like it enough to get enough information to be able to write about it. So That's true. I think most of it he actually did. Good. Another reason to read the book to see what craziness he did. And also, people should um, uh, read his books. You know, mm-hmm. um, his books are you can get them on Amazon or on yeah. Abe Books. They haven't been reprinted, so they're just the old original That's you know books, and they're fun. they're yeah. actually quite good. I really enjoy just reading them. So mm-hmm. I have a whole set that every once in a while I go back and reread one of them because they, they really are fun. Is the formality the same of the little clips of letters that you put in the book? Is that type of his type type of Style of writing? Well, yeah, his, his style of writing was a little peppier, you know, oh, and a little okay. more, you know, golly gee, let's do this. <laughs> you know, he was he was kind of the Peter Pan. You know, he didn't grow up even, you know, even when he was, um, you know, older, he still wrote in the style that people expected. However, he started to resent 
he didn't want to be that person. Mm-hmm. He wanted to be taken seriously towards the end, and he never was. And so it was really frustrating yeah. to him. Yeah, that. All right, so spoiler alert, Richard Halliburton dies. Yes, he does. Mm -hmm. (laughs) He is not. um, The easy thing about trying to figure out his timeline is he was born in 1900. So it's always easy for me to figure out, you know, whenever he was 20, it was 1920. (laughs) So uh, Richard Halliburton would would have died by this point anyway. (laughs) He's out a little early. But I won't say how he dies unless you want to share that. so I won't say if it's during one of his expeditions or not, but he does. What would you say is the most tragic part of his legacy, if you were to say there's a tragedy? Yeah, for sure. I mean, I think he continued to need to better himself to make it bigger and to make it more dramatic each time. Yeah. And so the last one was so risky yes. that it, it resulted in his death and that of the crew. And, you know, he was a marketer and he was, you know, so, you know, one of the things he did is, you know, he was going to pilot a uh, Chinese boat from Hong Kong to the San Francisco World's Fair. And there was going to be a big event around his arrival. And, it, you know, this, this adventurer did this crazy thing. And he, to, to, to fund it, he sold newsletters. Like he was going to read to his parents or, or his, his uh, secretary. And they would type and then mail it to people. So if you could pay a certain amount of money, you'd get a, a newsletter from him, you know, which is a very, you know, mar- almost like an email. Yeah. Then, um, and know, that was during this adventure. That was during the adventure. So okay. it was a one way. Another way he raised money was people could pay a lot of money to have their student on the boat, you know, which wasn't yeah. right no. you know, in retrospect. Um, this is like crowdfunding. Right. It is or absolutely like, early so he crowdfunding. Did a yeah, he did. He did, and and you know it was it was ill conceived. People who saw the boat said, you know, it, you shouldn't you shouldn't risk it. By the time he got to the point where he, you know, he had to make a decision: do I go? Do I stay? He was, you know, had debt. He he had a house he loved that he was trying to pay for. So the tragedy is that he had sort of painted himself into a corner. To where he really needed to to go on this adventure, you know, to be able yeah. to, to pay. And they weren't out too terribly long when a storm came. You know, the boat, of course, they had a radio distress call, and that's it. And so here in Memphis, um, his parents were sitting there, and his uh, mother got the call. Mm. And she hung up the phone and came back and said, it's over. Um, you know, for the rest of her life, whenever the phone would ring, she would say, oh, it's Richard. And she would go. And I think it was him. But, um, you know, he, he left an amazing legacy of writing and of work and of adventure. And yeah. um, he left a lot of just great work um, th- that we can all go back and enjoy now. But the sacrifice was, um, was ultimately his life. Yeah, and it was so stressful too. And you mentioned this earlier about he always needed to get money before his next book. It would be like he would run out of money, and he'd realize, "Oh, I need to get more for my next adventure, right?" So right. that well, I can make more money. Well, when him and Moy Stevens, he and Moy Stevens got back from their adventure, mm-hmm. he was like, you know, twenty thousand dollars in debt. The bank was like, "Look, you, you you're out of money." You yeah. Know? And so he immediately had to start trying to book schedules. You know, set up. Um, interviews with media, you know, he was yeah. always trying to figure so out ways, busy. you know, and, and to make matters worse, you know, he, during one of his adventures, he kind of faked his own death a little bit just to generate oh, some right. media. And so, you know, <laughs> that sort of, letters, so that but... made a lot of people question yeah. when he did die, was this just a publicity stunt? Yeah. yeah. So I thought that was sad in itself. Like one, like, what is this another publicity stunt? And then you t- you mentioned it was also kind of close to the war at that point so it was like right. everyone's focus is it shifted immediately yeah. and it just became a you know a page six kind of um, blip except for here here in Memphis the front page of the commercial appeal was, was. Uh, they really covered it with pictures and but the rest of the world he just pretty much vanished and they didn't really think that much I think that much about him after that unfortunately yeah. Yeah. And there was no video of him. There's no audio. You know, there's that one little clip of him on the elephant. And he wasn't a personality that people had ingrained in their psyche yet, you know, because the technology wasn't wasn't ready for that. So, yeah. you know, I think uh, the, the photographs that he left behind and the adventures and, and the, the things that he did, um, you know, I think all of us in Memphis, you know, should be really excited that, that he, you know, called Memphis home. Yeah. Well, I appreciate that. And I'm... I'm happy to always learn about these people that come from the city because obviously we're doing a podcast because it's so rich in history. 
of amazing figures and, and landmarks. And oh yeah, I mean, just as you drive around the city, you know, like yeah. just with with Richard Halliburton. Just I mean, as I drove around um, the last few days, I'm like amazed at all the different historical points from Richard Halliburton to Elvis Presley to Sun Studio to you know. Yeah. I mean, this city just really bulges with um, historic events, and that's why I'm so glad that you're doing the work you're doing to capture as much yeah. of it as possible. Well, yeah, I mean, it's comforting to know like people from Memphis have an appreciation for it, but sometimes it takes an outside person to come in and help people realize just how great where they are from. Oh, absolutely. Is. You know things that by far people who are from here don't know. You're pointing mm-hmm. things out. You know, a lot of people don't, didn't know about Maywood. And a lot of yeah, people forgot about it. I was one about, of them, but you yeah, learned about it. I know, yeah. <laughs> and a lot of people didn't know about Voodoo Village. So, yeah. you know, I, uh-huh. I think it's fantastic. And you guys are, you're able to have a sharper understanding for what is, you know, really interesting and what is, you know, valid. Oh, I, I find everything interesting. Yeah, so good, <laughs> good. It means, you know, good. please. But, yes, thank you so much for coming on the show. You're welcome. Um, I know it's already going to be passed by the time this broadcast, but you're going to do something. This is Elvis Week currently. Yeah. And you're going to have a, you're going to be on a panel. Is that right? Well, I've, at, got, I've actually got a book signing and a book event um, in, at Playhouse yes. or at, at a Circuit Playhouse, which is fun. So, yeah. Yeah. And then another one in Brownsville where I'm fun. So, yeah. I mean, lot, you're going to stay busy. But I'm going to put lots of pictures and stuff on uh, HalliburtonBook.com. HalliburtonBook.com. So I almost got my... Other I'll books, make sure to put that uh, in yeah. show notes. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Also, I do want to say, in the end of this book, you include an article with a quote from O.O. McIntyre. Oh, yeah. Who I assume is Odd McIntyre. That is correct. Which you recently wrote a book on. I did. That was my second book that yeah. I did was on yes. Odd McIntyre, um, who was a contemporary. And Odd's story was very similar in that he you know, used a new media um, to become... He became the uh, first pop culture reporter, I call him. Um, because he wrote about things like adventurers, and he wrote about uh, food and clothes and um, fashion, and he wrote about entertainment, and and um, so he he was very similar, you know, in a lot of ways to Richard. So I couldn't help but compare and contrast the two while I was writing. And that is an oddbook.com. Okay, that's the website. So for that when one. you wrote, when you were doing research for Richard Halliburton, did you when you wrote that or you you put that article? Mm-hmm. In that book, at that point, are you thinking, no, I might... I mean, I, no, I, I just thought, well, he wrote about him once. Let me go see if he's written about him more. And yeah. so the more I researched, I didn't find anything else, but I just loved the way he wrote. I loved his style of writing. I loved what he wrote about. And so I thought, you know, this is re- this would really make a, a good book. And so um, I put it aside, and I had to, I have to have a little bit of time between the books, but I'm right. already kind of working on the third one. So. Oh, any... Clues. Um, I'll have to come back when oh. I'm ready to announce it. <laughs> okay. Do another podcast. <laughs> yes, of course. <laughs> All right. Thank you so much. Thank you. It was so much fun. I just want to do this every day. Okay. Well, just you'll just have to come commute a little bit. Yeah. yeah. We'd have to do it on the phone. Oh, on the phone. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But I'm going to continue to listen. Just thank know you've you. got you've got a big uh, cheerleader in Washington D.C. Ah, oh, that's exciting. All right. Well. Everybody, um, join us on show notes at memphistypehistory.com slash Halliburton, and uh, we'll include links to your book and your, I guess, both books, since both are out. Absolutely. Yes. And go visit Scott at the museum in Washington, D.C. Absolutely. Museum.org. Museum.org. You can put that in the I'm show gonna notes. I'm going to put that in the show notes, too. There you go. <laughs> I will also take a picture of the Halliburton Tower on Rhodes. Do that. That sounds great, and I will be listening with all of your audience to the great work that you're doing. Thank you. You're listening to Memphis Type History, the podcast. We like your type. You've been listening to Memphis Type History, the podcast. It would mean so much to us if you head over to iTunes and give us a rating and review. Be sure to subscribe and never miss an episode. Want to be part of Memphis Type History and get behind the scenes content, merch, and more? Support us on Patreon at patreon.com slash Memphis Type History. That's Patreon spelled P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com slash Memphis Type History. Find more Memphis Type History on our blog at memphistypehistory.com, on Facebook, Instagram, and Pinterest as Memphis Type History, and on Twitter at Memphis Type. For all you listeners out there, I just want to send out a quick shout out to our supporters on Patreon, P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com. You've probably heard us mention it at the end of every episode because we cannot survive, uh, 
after a certain amount of time. Uh, unless you help support us, uh, because when the run- money runs out, that means we're going to have to stop. And the truth is, is we don't we don't want to um, necessarily stop because there's so much information in Memphis to cover. And you can be one of those supporters for just one dollar a month. That's all it takes. It's, just, it's as little as that one dollar a month. Uh, and when, if we get enough of you to do that, we can cover all our expenses. If you feel really generous, you can donate more than that. You can donate up to a thousand a month if you really want to. Five dollars, ten dollars. Go to patreon.com, P A T R E O N.com slash Memphis Type History. Check out the goodies that you can get for being a supporter. And like I said, with just a dollar, you get something. Moral of the story support us. Go to patreon.com, patreon.com slash Memphis Type History. Look at the stash of goodies we have to offer. Decide which one you want most to make your heart the most happy. And just know that your hearts happy make our hearts happy. Thank you.